Okay, great. Um, we should do the, like, you know at the beginning of all of your C videos where they're, like, pounding the table? We should do that. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, let's do this. Wait, one second, one second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just ruined the whole thing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> do it again, guys, please. Why, why is not working? Yeah, that's Time to think, it's time to think. <laughs> my thought, my head is empty. I think about nothing. No <laughs> thoughts, just <laughs> sovereign nations. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, so, I know everyone's good. I'm just going to drink some wine though to start it. Is it going to be a speedy PMC? I don't know. I don't, this, I don't like that. So, the problem is, it's written on paper, so. I, like this could all go very fast or you could all go very slow, who knows? But I'm going to try to keep on the slower side. Okay, starting in three, two, one. First and framing, who are the people who are likely doing this in the status quo? Uh, likely who are the creditors in the status quo? One, this probably looks like Western institutions such as hedge funds, international organizations like the IMF or the World Bank, or in specific countries like the US, for example. I think there's the most likely, one, given that they are the ones that have the majority of this capital, but two, are the ones that have historically been doing this in the past, so these uh, most of the countries that are being lended to probably trust them the most. Thus, I think this debate lies around whether they're going to continue to give these uh, loans or whether or not they might come from a worse source overall. Hint, hint, China and Russia. Our first argument is that less bonds are going to be bought. First, what are bonds? One, recognize that this is money invested long term. Like you're generally giving money to the government with some, uh, like in a promise that you will get that money back later in the future, usually with some high return on it. Many times bonds don't have that uh, uh, interest rates that are at that high, no. Secondly, recognize that many of these types of uh, bonds are necessary for infrastructure because many of the developing countries that we're talking about that are issuing these bonds don't have cash necessary to implement infrastructure. So they must use bonds as a way to get cash so that they can pay for things like healthcare, like hospitals, like roads, so that people can get to things like schools, etc. Without that, it destroys the ability for people to access or use things like welfare on the ground. And you know, even if they say things that you can give them money, obviously that money can't be used if you don't have the infrastructure that you can spend that money on, i.e. if there are no hospitals, you can't spend your money on your health care. Secondly is the fact that uh, uh, secondly is the fact that they already have very little inf uh, existing infrastructure right now. Recognize that many of these developing countries are developing, they don't have pre-existing infrastructure that can use for many of their projects, which means, one, we want them to have better in, uh, economies in the future, we need to have give, be giving them the cash right now in order to set up those businesses. Secondly, why are they always going to the West in the status quo? One, one recognize that the West is much more stable, has much more stable forms of funding. One, they have much more experts in the, and have better expertise in uh, outlining these things. Secondly, recognize that the West is much more concerned with political goals, such as democracy, etc. But so, so critically, uh, when they're giving these out and they have some promise that they're going to be uh, like uh, uh, giving that money back, given that they know that they're going to do, be doing these committees on our side of the house, that means they're able to trust you, which means on, their side, on our side of the house, they're probably going to trust you in giving you a lot of this money. Secondly, is the fact that developing countries largely rely on Western trade. So we already have pre-existing uh, communications with these countries and many of these institutions in these countries to have incentives to ally with them. Additionally, though, you trust them because of their better historical track records, e.g. look at the fact that Sri, uh, that Sri Lanka had to give like its support to, uh, to, uh, uh, to China because that had a 99-year lease on it, and then when they defaulted, that screwed out over the entire country. So obviously, the track records of Western institutions are probably better. Why then are these institutions going to pull out when you don't do this on their side of the house? I want to first characterize what the communities are and why these communities are very likely to work. Recognize that these are uh, things that are in, likely going to be enforced by international organizations. One, these uh, international organizations use this as a source of legitimacy for them, so you always are going to make, it, uh, make other forms of aid conditional on you always following and abiding by these agreements. And recognize that many of these countries already uh, rely on heavy landing on this aid, so this humanitarian aid, for example, or you bring in food to this region, so when you don't have the money to pay for these things, you get help from these or international organizations and they do this well. When you're not but with so that necessarily means you're very likely to be doing these committees well. Secondly, to recognize these committees don't uh, don't necessarily feel that you do any specific thing. That is, uh, you still there's talks with everyone and you come to a reasonable agreement with everyone. Now I want to note they probably will give arguments about why these people are going to be infighting, but recognize these are talks not linearly. There are talks with everyone at the same time, right? So it's not like you talk with the U.S. and then you give them something, and then you talk with the hedge fund, and you give them something. You're talking with everyone at the same time, so you're uh, taking all these things into account. So it's very unlikely that someone gets screwed over in one of these. Recognize 
recognize also that investors know that these are talks and know that there is some risk, but they are okay with that risk insofar as they know that one, there are incentives to abide by these talks, and two, that they know that the large majority of these countries are probably not going to get to this uh, place to begin with. Why then do they pull out on their side of the house? One, recognize there is no competing mechanism. That is, there's no other way for you to do this. And when they talk about informal, uh, informal talks, one, these countries should just never do these talks overall. So you'd have to provide you an incentive for them to want to do this. But secondly, it's the fact that you don't have institutions enforcing these informal talks because there's no formal contract that was signed such that they don't have a legitimacy to do this. I think this also is the fact that they have to compete with other creditors a lot more on their side of the house. Because recognize, even when they do get to those informal talks, you're doing that with far less of the investors. So this necessarily means, one, small investors are always going to get screwed over. But also hedge funds, for example, are much like to get screwed over over a country, for example, because saving the country has a lot more power, you're probably going to always capitulate to that country more than any other investor. Which necessarily means when you're never talking with everyone on their side of the house, many of these other people believe that there is much higher risk that they don't get talked to, which means they never get that money overall. Even if countries then do this very well, obviously non-countries don't care about the things like politics or democracy, so they're always never gonna uh, they're always gonna be scared that they're not getting this money back. That necessarily means one, a lot of a lot of people just stop lending up uh, 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 money to these people, especially since they recognize that the risk is very, very high, given that even if the majority of these countries would be doing this well, the small minority that do it really, really badly would completely screw them over, because they're the ones they're going to be lending a lot to. So look for, at, for example, developing countries that then backslide and then use that money very, very corruptly or very, very poorly, and recognize initially that, one, many of these things are not predictable. So you never know exactly when a revolution is going to go really, really well or really, really poorly. But it's also the case that many of these things are hiding the fact that they're very, very authoritarian or being are managing these things very, very well by projecting an image that they're very good to the West and things like that. So it's hard to discern which of these countries are good or bad. Thus, in the risk, uh, in the risk calculus, you must be less likely to actually uh, give money to these things. Why is that bad? One, we already gave you all the reasons above for why you need this infrastructure, because it's necessary for the use of welfare overall. When people aren't getting access to this, they always get screwed over. Secondly, though, let's say that they don't, let's say that they are still getting lots of money on their side of the house. We think the other ways in which you negotiate are far worse. One, the alternative is very likely just vulture funds. If you don't know what a vulture fund is, it just means you sell money, uh, sell your debt on the dollar. So if you loan them $50 million, instead you get, uh, let's say, $10 million from the uh, vulture fund, and now they have the right to negotiate that debt, and they own the debt. Why are vulture funds so bad? One, they recognize they don't care about things like international pressure, etc. So when the U.S. does this, they probably don't going to be doing this in incredibly capricious ways, so it makes them see, um, seem undemocratic and actually hurts them electorally as well as only the international stage. But vulture funds are ind completely independent and private organizations so don't care nearly as much about this, which means they're much more likely to do this in completely capricious ways. This looks like things like drowning them in lawsuits, for example, and recognize that law the lawsuit money that these countries have been spending in these international organizations is coming from things like welfare, etc., especially since those are they have spend money on other things, etc. That necessarily means, one, you're always going to be wasting a lot more money in these countries, but two, you're always going to be way less lax when you have to pay this money back to the vulture funds. The other thing is, when they actually do the inter intervention, you're likely to have extreme forms of austerity and are going to be forced to sell off your assets, etc., because the vulture funds want your money back as fast as possible, since they already gave the $10 million to the U.S. or whoever, so they need this try or die for them. They have to get this money right now. On the counterfactual, you can extend this with like Western organizations and things like this. We already give you lots of reasons about why this is likely the case. Lastly, though, if people do pull out, they have to go somewhere else to get this money. So remember, they literally will just starve to death if they don't have the cash necessary to prop up the infrastructure. That looks like China and Russia. Why this is the because they're the only other option. Why is this worse? One, recognize that these countries many times politically coerce you. They make you do things like have huge leases on your infrastructure. And if you default, that necessarily means that you're not able to Use that infrastructure in the future, which means one, your people who have jobs on the ground are very screwed over because you give up your port away. Everyone living at the port is not able to work there. Proud. Thank you. Thank you. So I need a second to sit. Yeah. I gotta do my little voodoo dance and all that too, so don't worry. Gotta do the little thing with the snake. Yeah. Does anyone else get the thing where Zoom just like keeps flashing with notifications if you don't have Wi-Fi? No, no. no. It's just that crazy. sounds terrible. That's crazy. That's crazy. This girl thought he was gonna be so relatable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm ready. Off case, on case.
three, two, one. I want to be very clear with the framing here, because I think what is going to win this debate is who can best service the release of off, which is going to be specifically the countries who are within debt and who are defaulting on their debt. Insofar as those are the countries that are the only ones who are affected by the policy of the credit committees, I think these are fundamentally the only ones that we should be talking about. They're going to try to upstream all of our impacts, but say why this de why debt in general is bad, but we think insofar as they are generating more debt, and they are already in a situation in which debt indebtedness are happening. Those are which we, we should care about, the best outcomes for those. I want to talk about some framing for this debate. First off, on framing, what does it look like when one of these nations falls into debt? And what does it look like when these committees are formed and their causes exist? When a nation falls into debt, it is likely for two reasons. Either their economy collapsed due to a supply or demand shock for their relative goods, or because a universal global recession is falling on them and limiting the amount of money coming into their economy, therefore there is no stimulus of cash coming in when the nation does not have its own wealth. Or, alternatively, if the nation is developing well and has good growth, but the loan that it got it would which was creating this credit was fundamentally predatory, meaning that it was at such high interest rates or such a quick repayment plan that even their expectation of growth that was going to be good and would be a strong marker of a country would be no way to keep up with this interest. Why is this important for us to understand about the two countries that are falling into this uh, situation? It is because in order for Gov to win, they need to prove that they are helping both countries with this clause because otherwise they're just arbitrarily choosing which non-developed country or developing country is going to be punished to a cycle of poverty. Because no, once you stop being able to pay back this debt, you are fundamentally within an interest trap. Essentially, all of your means of production, your wealth, and all of the things that are coming into your country are going to the crediting countries and institutions. This means that you have no way that you can develop for your people, but it also means you're taking money directly from your people's pockets so they can no longer support themselves, feed themselves, etc. This is not only going to mean that you can never get out of this cycle of poverty, but it means the people on the ground are suffering. So fundamentally, they need to be able to help both tranches of people who would be suffering in these scenarios for this to be something that we support. And so far as they cannot do that, I think there's going to be a very clean off the ballot. I also want to talk about what the framing of these committees looks like. We think that fundamentally when these committees occur, by the information that we get from the background, the committees are forming because of a communication. They have a set of standards that once the committees are uh, formed of all of the creditors, they sit down with the editor and they say, we have met, we have discussed what the terms are, here are what the terms are, agree to them. No, this is not a fucking negotiation. This is all of the creditors, the ones who currently have all of the leverage, the ones who are currently getting all of the interest and who are getting all of the money, meeting beforehand and saying, this is what is going to best serve us. Not considering the reality of the ground and not even hearing the opinion of the reality of the ground, and then presenting these terms to the nation which is currently defaulting on its debt. This means that it's significantly less likely that these terms are going to be reasonable, that they're going to be something that the country can meet, or that they're going to be something that is reasonably going to help the people on the ground or add any relief to the current economic downturn that they are in. Insofar as this is the case, we think that it is going to be very bad for any negotiation because the counterfactual, as we get from the background, is going to be that the crediting nation is able to individually negotiate with all of the nations who are crediting with them. This means that they can get individuals, uh, this means that with the, pri with the promise of priority and saying that we are going to pay you off first, they can get individual better rates and pay the creditors off of each other. This is good because it means that the creditors get more money, or more creditors get money, but also it means that, they, that we are more likely to get plans that are going to service the nation that defaulted on their debt because of the sheer fact that they are not because of the sheer fact that they are able to play the advantage of the open market of the creditors and renegotiation against each other. Okay. With that being said, let's go into our arguments. The first is that. Uh, the first is that uh, leads into our independent point, which is that this creates unfair negotiations. I think it's pretty simple when you check everything that I just said, that this is going to be an unfair negotiation between a variety of parties with wealth, with money, who don't understand the standards on the ground, who are therefore going to be presenting terms that have to be accepted if you are buying into this clause. Note, when you buy into this clause saying you have to recognize the committee, it means you automatically have to buy in to whatever they present to you. You have no ability to negotiate. And so far as this is the case, this is going to be very damaging for the nation's ability to develop or restructure the Debt, so they are paying less interest for more guaranteed payouts. Insofar as this is the case, this is going to be very bad and lead to more predatory, uh, predatory committee standards. Insofar as that is the case, we think that this means that just more nations in general are going to pay off, uh, keyly both nations in both tranches. But also, we think that. Uh, also, we think it's fundamentally going to be preferable for all of the creditors because all of the creditors are going to be selfishly uh, incentivized. I.e., if you are a hedge fund within the United States who bought 1% of this large loan that happened to like Sri Lanka, for example, you aren't going to care about all of the loans that are happening from other countries. Instead, you're going to say, I, as the hedge fund, want my fucking money first. So insofar as you aren't going to want the credit committee, because you're going to want the ability to go to the Sri Lankan government and say, hey, I know 20% of this is owned by China, but if you pay me now, I will cut your interest rates from like 50% to 1%. That way I get a marginal return and I make sure I get my money now. Insofar as 
everyone will want the opportunity to get this incentive. This will be something that will be vastly preferable by all the, uh, all the creditors, and therefore they are more likely to prefer these contracts in a world in which they don't automatically have to agree to the credit committees. Uh, yeah, so opposed to no negotiation, which is a bad negotiation, we actually get better results from the people on the ground because it's more likely that we are going to get realistic reduced interest rates and not just like a fake concession from this large committee, which at the end of the day just wants their money or wants to take over the means of production of a country like Sri Lanka. I want to note that a lot of the actors that they are talking about are like, oh, these Western institutions will be really good, right? They aren't going to like do what China did and like take over the land or the means of production or resources of all of these developing countries. They give no fucking warrant for that. Insofar as I think the United States does this all the time as they wish to take over other countries. This is a form of economic uh, colonization that we do all across the fucking world today to influence our, uh, to increase our spheres of influence. I think that this is something that is happening by both actors, so we shouldn't be caring about who the loan is coming from. We should just be removing the mechanism by which any country can have any kind of influence of fiscal colonizing to begin with. Insofar as this is the case, I think that we clearly link into limiting the tools of the oppressors and therefore uh, allowing the individuals on the ground to not have to be forced to opt into these interests and instead can play all the hedge funds and all of the governments against each other to get the better rate and the better quality for the individuals on the ground. Uh, yeah, this also is going to affect initial contracts. If individuals know that, the, that when uh, the dungeoning country is signing the contract, they have to opt into the credit committee, this is going to be really bad because that just means one of the creditors who has to be a bad actor and say, wait a second, I can really milk them for all they fucking have if I move them to a credit committee because then everyone will just prefer our monopoly negotiation. And so far as this is the case, just one of the debtors or one of the creditors will have to say, I'll just make my initial loan really fucking predatory. That way they are innately going to default on it and is going to then trigger them defaulting on the sovereign funds. Insofar as this is the case, because the, insofar as this is the case, this means all other loans outside of this large sovereign loan is going to be fundamentally more predatory because insofar as you can buy stake within the sovereign loan, you are going to want them to default elsewhere. That way the credit trust beliefs and there's less money within the economy to pay off the sovereign loan. Essentially, this is just a lot of warranting as to why if you allow this to happen, everyone else who makes any other kind of loan has high incentive to make those loans predatory as fuck. That way they can buy into the sovereign loan and the country can default on that and they can get even more money by being part of this larger scale negotiation. Okay, I now want to move to the PMC. Essentially, they talk about, oh, uh, we want to, they wanted to flag that like, if the money isn't coming from Western nations, it is going to come from like China and Russia. One, they need to prove the delta. Why are loans from China and Russia fundamentally better than the United States? And so far as I don't think they can do that, because we do the same fucking thing with the debt, I don't think they win that argument there. But also note that like China and Russia are doing this in scope. Don't let them tell you that the Western nations are the only ones doing this, because like, what the fuck is the Belt and Road Initiative? But also, we want to talk about the idea about like relying on, like, actually, I, I'm going to skip all of that, because I don't think it matters, because Western is bad, too. Uh, the main argument is that individuals are going to pull out of the loan if they don't have these guarantees for their contracts. One, cross by the argument that we make on our case, which is the idea that creditors prefer these standards because they would always like the ability to go one-to-one -to, -one to the nation and pull their own money out. Essentially say that we will give you lower interest rates for more assurance that we are paid first. Recognize that all of the people who are offering this credit, once the credit is defaulted, recognize the asset as burning. It is not a stable asset. It is not something that is going to guarantee their money back. And insofar as this is the case, they're going to be scared of losing their money. So in an attempt to get it back, they're just going to go to the nation and say, I will give you the best terms possible to make sure I get paid fucking first, even if you default on everyone else. And so far as this is preferable for all of the firms, they will offer for that. I think that beats all of their cases. Vulture funds are not unique. Thank you. I started writing it, but that I got you. That's that's what's winning. Mm -hmm. Starting in three, two, one. At the top of their speech, they tell us we ought to prioritize the least well off, and that obviously falling into debt is really bad, but they don't answer this question. We think that if it is the case that there are certain countries that are more likely to default, the kinds of creditors that are likely to offer them loans are the ones that have high risk, high reward, in the absence of certainty that they will be able to get their money back. That's why on their side of the house, the kinds of loans they're offered and the ways that repayment for these loans are demanded are always going to be bad unless you can incentivize more altruistic investors to go in if they have some higher degree of certainty that their loans can be repaid. 
Secondarily, I just do not think they engage with the counterfactual. That is, given that their assertion is that creditors want their money back, we tell you that the only ways and the only alternative mechanisms you can do this are really bad. Unless they provide us a reason for why they have a counterfactual and that counterfactual is likely, you have to default to ours. Third, they ignore the fact that in these negotiations, every single creditor has veto power. So all this idea about larger creditors overshadowing smaller ones obviously falls to the model itself. First thing that I want to do then, the way that bonds are issued are going to be largely different and largely worse. Why is this the case? We think that the kinds of bonds that are issued are inherently different on both sides of the house. Their argument is, oh, obviously you would take deals from Russia and China because this is happening empirically. Yes, this is true. But the reason for why this happens is because we say that there is an asymmetry of the ways in which these bonds are offered. So Sam tells you that if you have an offer of two better or worse loans, obviously you choose the ones that don't require massive austerity efforts. But in the absence, obviously that's why you turn to things like Russia or China. So why do we get more people issuing better bonds on our side of the house? First is because you have a guarantee of repayment and you get more altruistic actors. On their side of the house, the kinds of actors you get are the ones that want large amounts of leverage, but on our side of the house, you have actors who are inherently going to be less risky, going to be less averse to things like imperialism. Sorry, could you talk a little bit quieter? Secondarily, you have more people willing to lend to developing countries because on their side of the house, they tell you that these countries are structurally disadvantaged and it's harder for them to repay the debt, so they do not warrant why, in the absence of these committees, the U.S. wouldn't always invest in a second-tier country rather than countries that are least well off, which on their side of the house, they don't prove why they get good bonds in the first place. But thirdly, you have less appearance of imperialism. Why is that the case? Given that the West has to explicitly capitulate to a group of creditors, come to consensus, and actually come to the negotiation table, obviously this perceptually seems like there's less imperialism because they have more um, requirement to cooperate with other actors. They have less ability to impose their own will, oppose their own autonomy, and because they also have to agree to the back and forth to that sovereign country itself, which they do not have to do in a counterfactual. Second, why do we also get better investors on our side of the house that have less predatory, predatory tones? Lows. Note this directly engages with their argument about how you create cycles of poverty. Number one, we get more smaller investors entering because obviously their assertion is that larger investors get paid first or they have more leverage. This is the exact mechanism that we use to talk about why, for instance, large hedge funds are the only ones investing, whereas other smaller firms have a fear of investing because they know they're always the last to get repaid. On our side of the house, given that they're involved in the negotiation and involved in the restructuring plan, they're more likely to invest. What, what is the implication of this? You get more competition in the kinds of loans you are offered, therefore allowing the sovereign country to also have better leverage and also better options. But second, you obviously have more investors now and they're more compatible. Why is this the case? Because you're unlikely to invest in a country where you do not like the other creditors. Why is this? A, because obviously you know you won't ever be able to come to consensus with them when it comes to negotiation. Why is this important? Number one, it means that the kinds of actors that enter are more altruistic because they all have an agreement with each other. But number two, it it also means the kinds of solutions they're likely going to come to are more compatible in the first place. That is, they're not going to disagree on the kinds of policies or the kinds of legislation you want to pass in the structuring, and they're also going to offer loans that are compatible with each other and you also lie. have the same kinds of conditionality, whereas on our side of the house, you, whereas on their side of the house, you don't get this kinds of cooperation because the ways that loans are offered are incredibly decentralized. Second then, why do I actually think that this is better for the country? Because their assertion is, oh, this is going to be really, really bad and um, and uh, this is going to be really bad and the country is going to suffer. I want to do some weighing here. If it is the case that the country has brought themselves to default through their own bad economic policies, even if it is the case that these creditors might not have perfect solutions, we would say that it is more likely that they have better economic foresight and better economic solutions than the sovereign government itself. So what does this necessarily do then? Why is it the case that it is good for these creditors to have these kinds of agreements? Because they say, oh, the committee is going to fight, they're not going to negotiate, it's going to be really bad. But this is always better than the alternative, which is obviously there's going to be a race for you to be the first creditor to get your money back because given that the country cannot make their money back in the long term, or given that they're not going to be, once they default, they literally do not have the capital to repay their debts, you always have an incentive to be the first creditor to come to the negotiation table because you want to be paid off first. 
But the counterfactual is better because number one, you reduce informational asymmetry. That is, you no longer have the fears because you know that before any action is taken, everybody has to talk about it. Number two, you no longer have the time sensitivity of being the first to have to take action, which means the kinds of solutions you come to are going to be more long-termist and more holistic. But thirdly, because you get things like collective bargaining, which means the concessions that you're able to get are better because now you have the backing of international organizations. Now you can take coordinated actions. Now you can do things like long sanctions if they do disagree rather than do very short termist things. Why is this necessarily good then? We think that this means that the kinds of restructuring that you're going to get are at least going to be comparatively more long termist because if you are one creditor and now you're going to come to the kinds of agreement where each creditor gets paid back over time, right, and not one just gets paid one long, uh, one lump sum in the short term, that means you're going to do things like extend the terms of the agreement, allow monthly payments, do levels of government restructuring that prioritize the country continuing to economically grow because your ability to get loans are contingent on economic growth rather than prioritizing the kind of short-termist things that they get in the lack of informational asymmetry. So that's the reason why on our side of the house we actually get better ways for the country to grow in the future rather than people trying to race to be the first one to the table. Second thing that I want to talk about then is the actual counterfactual itself. So they don't give us counterfactuals, but we tell you we literally use the same incentives that they talk about, about wanting to get your money, and talk about why the counterfactual is likely going to be worse. They do not engage with their argument about vulture funds, and they do not engage with their arguments about countries doing very pernicious actions. What is the argument here? So right now, if you're an individual creditor, the only way you can get your money back is by negotiating with the country. The reason why this is the case is because as they tell you, the country also has to agree to the terms. This is the reason why they have negotiation power as well. Because most of the policies that are suggested are going to require the voluntary implementation from these countries. They're going to require the country actually taking this policy and doing it in good ways. This is why there's an incentive to create a mutually beneficial policy between the creditors and the sovereign country itself. But secondarily here, it means that if these countries rely on the voluntary capitulation of these sovereign nations, but they know they cannot get it, or in the absence of certainty, this is the reason why they are very often offloading risks to things like vulture funds. Vulture funds have the unique mechanism to, imply, to apply lawsuits on these countries, to force them and literally create legal mechanisms for them to apply their policies. The reason creditors don't want to do this is because they do not always win the lawsuits, so obviously the sunk cost is not worth it. But for a vulture fund who's spending very little on acquiring this sovereign debt, it is going to be worth it because their risk calculus is inherently different. What Sam tells you is, every bad impact they want to talk about gets magnified when you offload this kind of loan to a vulture fund, who is way more willing to do things like make you default on your other kinds of payment, way more, way more willing to do things like implement massive amounts of austerity so that they can get their money back, way more willing to do things like seize your assets and force you to sell your collateral. So until they engage with the counterfactual, they cannot win this debate. Very proud. I didn't want to speak, so I'll do pleasantries now because I have no other opportunity. Um, I remember after you ended, you wanted to. Yeah, I forgot. Okay. Um, thanks, Penn, for hosting a great tournament. It's been a great. It's been a great time. I very much enjoyed it, even though I lost my car last night. <laughs> I'll tell you guys later. Um, and I've enjoyed debating with you. I'm glad we were able to get you qualled. Hopefully, I can also get qualled. Oh, you qualled for the quarters. Woo! Uh, GW, I love when I get spectators in the room. I think this is the first round Sarah has spectated for me, which is wild. I'm paying them out for exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You never spectate me. It's very special. Um, and then it's like, well, yeah, we're off. Great friends. Glad to be debating you. I have like double vision. It's fun. Okay. Um, I'll get started. It's gonna be kind of an off flow now. Um, so do with that what you will. I'll get started in three, two, one. The 
The MG misses the response that Aiden gives in the LOC that all the institutions are engaging in fiscal colonizing. That they are looking for a fire sale on assets and that working in these committees means that it is likely the case that they are able to get the best deals because they have the highest amount of leverage, but also even after they default, it traps them in a cycle of debt because these committees guarantee that you're going to continue to get money, to get good deals for these like ways that the creditors engage with them to be the most beneficial for them in the first place. But secondarily that, I don't think that the, like, the committees themselves are the tipping point for Western institutions. Three warrants here. One, uh, three warrants here. One, there's other parts, they need the other parts of the world to develop and improve because they have a need for goods or need for production to happen in other, other places, i.e. as you're specializing more in like make, like doing invention and other things, you need other places to be creating things. So they care about development happening. Economic improvement is often a liberalizing factor on nations, which Western nations care about in the first place, which means that they want to see economic development happening. Three, it is likely the case that they don't actually see the harm of not getting their money back because they're able to like let their, they are seen as a creditor or they're less worried about getting their investment back because of the way that modern monetary policy works. So they're not as like harmed, they're not as harmed by the loss as like an other institution would be. All of that means is that they're willing to give money even if it is risky. But that being said, they're going to go after it and they're going to harm individuals. All of that means is that Western institutions continue to invest and continue to engage with the individuals there, but it isn't the tipping point for them. Also, I think that Western institutions often are still able to get their money back insofar as the, like, pe the debtors who are getting money are able to securitize the assets that they get and are able to actually like get money back in ways that are beneficial to the longevity of it, because often creditors are super, super short-termist when they have a creditor committee that's rep representing them and have massive amounts of power over those communities, over those individuals. The only counterfactual they have is that the Western institutions pull out or won't go there, but even without creditor committees, we still see that Western institutions are investing in these areas and so far as a new concept that has just come about, which means that it is not the tipping point to investment, otherwise we would have seen massive economic collapse that would have happened in the first place when there were certain nations that wouldn't do this because they were dependent on, like, they were dependent on having, like, loans coming from the Western nation in the first place that had already given it to them. Okay. They give us an argument that is the, the they're only going to go for high risk, high reward, high rewards uh, types of investments, and it's the only way to get their money back. The fact of the matter is, is that they're looking to get a fire sale on all of the different type, the all of the different types of goods that exist in these nations. They're able to do high interest rates. They're able to guarantee that the committee in the future is going to charge the highest rate for money, which harms the individuals on the ground because it traps them in cycles of debt. But also, it's just Western nations have an incentive to do this just as much as vulture funds have an incentive to do this. So they're always aligned. There's no worse counterfactuals. You probably have money coming in from both sides or both groups in the first place. Place because there's no counterfactual or way to get money. The counterfactual is that you have the capacity to restructure your debt, go to other creditors that give you lower rates that are going to then allow you to pay it back and securitize other goods that you have there in the first place, which means that you're able to pay it off, but I have a better long-term incentive because creditors are always looking to get their money back as quickly as possible. They also said, ah, veto power is going to protect individuals. It's never actually used because the people on the committee themselves are working together to make sure that the money goes back to the creditors in the first place. Then they tell us, that, oh, um, that they'll go to other places like Russia and China. I think this is generally non unique insofar as they're giving better rates to crowd out Western investment. That means that they're giving lower interest rates because they want them to have that money in the first place. All of that means is that they want it to come to crowd out Western investment, which doesn't mean that it's the tipping point. But also, um, but also they tell us uh, you'll, they tell us that you'll never, you will never go into loans with other countries that they don't like because they won't be able to negotiate. Well, the response is that you turn this, that China and the US will go into more loans if they know that they can individually negotiate so we get more loans on our side of the house. But also they tell us that they, um, they get better rates. They don't care who, like countries don't care who is giving, where this money is coming from, they just care about what lowest interest rate is and what they can get the money cheapest for in the first place. Then they tell us that, ah, it's a back and forth. Well, the, the problem here is that the committee has all of the power. One, they have it because when you came and structured the deal in the first place, you were inherently at a weak position. They never respond to any of the warrants that Aiden gives you in LOC, that they're giving deals that are guaranteed to fail so they get more control in the long term. The formation of the credit cr creditor committees are designed in a way that benefits the creditors because they're able to set them up when you're in a position of desperation, either because you have capital from a recession happening or you need to stimulate the economy. Both of these are imperatives that mean that they come to the negotiating table even if they don't want the creditor committee, even if it's harmful for the ways that their debt gets restructured in the long run. But then also, um, there's like international expectations of the ways that this looks because they want the credit, like there is international pressure for the creditors to be benefited in the first place between these committees have massive amounts of power that harm you. Then they tell us, 
that they're they're first move, they're going to move to be more long termist and holistic. I'm going to be honest, I think the MO knifes themselves in this argument because they say that, ah, creditors are going to come one by one or there's a first mover advantage to being able to go there. One, this isn't, this doesn't actually happen insofar as, like, it happens when you default on your loan as a, like, debtor, which means that the trigger to doing this always comes from the debtor in the first place. But even if this argument is true, this removes all of the arguments that they give you about there being some level of, like, uh, them not being exploitative or they're not being a first mover advantage or them working together for there to be good interest there because they're looking to move first and have harm to the company country in the first place. Then they tell us that they are uh, they tell us that there is going to be negotiating with countries. Negotiation with credit creditors and bolster funds are likely cutting a bad deal in the first place because you don't have the capacity to leverage anything insofar as the committee is there. But then they tell us that what they give us this argument that is like Western countries won't prefer these what Here's why Western countries won't prefer these committees. They will recognize that China and Russia are also in on these loans, and they will not want China and Russia to be paid off, and therefore they will not sign the committee when the committees and countries are, and will instead pay individuals in negotiations. But then also, um, but then also on the argument that we get about time sensitive sensitivity. This is just a bullshit argument insofar as the these loans are also like 50 year repayment plan and therefore are long term, but also long term negotiations will just be making countries like Sri Lanka and sharecroppers for China because they will never be able to pay off the loan, but they will think that they can if they work for 100 years. On the argument that they give about vulture funds, this is generally non unique because insofar as you've already defaulted on the debt, the people who are super scared will be selling to vulture funds in both worlds. The only difference is the creditor committees. Insofar as the tipping point into their counterfactual, one isn't supported by the information we have in the info slide, but two isn't supported by the. Oh, my phone died. I don't know why I want to run. Good pause. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> stand up and say we have not provided a counterfactual or engaged with it is because of a misunderstanding of what we said straight out of PMC that I think Sidra just reiterated. The counterfactual is what the info slide tells us it is. It is then, instead of facing a committee, they just negotiate one-on-one -on -one with each individual country, which we warrant out to you will lead to significantly less interest having to be paid by the credit by the debtor country because of the sheer fact that they're able to negotiate contracts with smaller actors who are scared of not getting paid back because the large actors will outweigh them in the committee and therefore will cut you lower interest rates. And so far as this is the case, I think our counterfactual is a lot stronger and not something they have engaged with whatsoever, so they can't really generate any offense there. Additionally, though, I would like to talk about the offense that our opponents try to go for and explain 
explain why, how at best it is mitigatory and therefore cannot be weighed on. First off, they go, China and Russia are always going to be the eternal alternative. Citrus warns out to you why China and Russia happen within SWO, because China and Russia has the same fiscal goals in terms of investment in developing countries that the United States has, so they are constantly within a free market of offering lower interest rates and trying to outbid each other for development projects within these nations. Insofar as this committee is not going to be a tipping point for any of these bodies, because the committees are also new, we don't think that they were, we are going to get any warrants to this way, especially because MG never meaningfully interacts with our arguments that Western institutions, such as hedge funds, that are doing these loans when they aren't necessarily corporations, are, guess what, prefer the ability to individually negotiate, so they will offer more loans if we don't have these committees to begin with. Insofar as this is the case, we think that this is going to help the lease wall off better. Also, they might try to collapse on vulture funds. This doesn't really make sense because, one, the United States isn't selling its debt to a vulture fund. Like, that's not how the economy works because of the sheer fact that the United States has way more fucking money than a vulture fund could ever dream of. But also because of the warrants that Sidra gives you, which is quite plain that if you are selling it to a vulture fund, it is because you don't think you are getting your money back. That isn't going to happen whether or not there is a credit committee. That fear is going to be triggered the second the country defaults, in which case you're just going to sell the debt to a vulture fund, and that will be that that isn't going uh, to be affected by the committee. Yes? The argument that the U.S. is not giving money, is not giving their debt to the vulture funds because they have more fun money than vulture funds, I think is a good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> being said, Sidra's response, not new. Want to be very clear about that. That was all as well. Everybody good? He really tried to sneak. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I'm not even gonna attempt I had a really good record of getting new shit in the PM. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, why not? Um, what was going on? <laughs> okay. He really, he really tried. I, 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 yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Two, two or three. Okay, perfect. Uh, just give me a second. Three, two, one. But insofar as they still need to beat Sitter's warranting, which is what is triggering the vulture funds isn't the structure of the crediting committee, insofar as that didn't exist until recently, but also because that is not going to have any effect on the payment of it of small actors. Individuals who are going to sell to the vulture funds sell the second there is a default, they don't sell after there's long negotiations, so they don't get any offense on vulture funds anyways. Essentially, at the end of this, unless they bring up new arguments, which I will new call, um, <laughs> this is not going to be any offense whatsoever from, up, uh, from Gov. Therefore, where do you just vote for us? We have a bevy of offense, but I'm going to make it pretty clear. The first one is going to be, we just get less debt. When you have individualized negotiations, you are able to play off of the fears of the small-time actors who fear that when they go and if they negotiate in large monopolies with countries like the United States or with China, that they will simply not be paid. Because guess what? If you are defaulting on your debt, you don't have the money to pay off any, anyone, so it becomes an issue of priority. And the small firms want priority, and the only way that they can get this is through individualized negotiations by saying we will cut your interest rate from 50% to 1%. This is the example that we give you in PMC. Insofar as this is the case, all of these firms, all of these smaller parties, or even the smaller countries who are not the United States and China but are still in on these loans, will be doing that fundamentally. Therefore, the amount of debt that is owed for these countries is going to be significantly less. The alternative is these countries get looped into the demands of China and Russia and all of the other negotiators who fundamentally don't give a fuck about the fact that this isn't that it isn't going to get, get repaid as long as they get repaid. They don't care about the uh, downstream actors, the B trench investors, the C trench investors, etc. And instead, they set exorbitantly high interest rates because they have the ability to control these committees and say you need to pay, you still need to pay the 50%, or maybe we'll be really generous and knock it down to 49, in which case they, they get their money, the debt is still very incredibly large for the deadening nations. They don't get any uh, any like saving on the margins, and they're just significantly more debt. Insofar as we get marginally less debt, you vote for us very clearly right there. Because if there's less debt, that means more money going to the people, going to stimulating the economy and not being taken out. Okay, there's then uh, the second idea about fiscal colonizing. Um, this is just fundamentally bad. I think that flows on less debt. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, let's just talk about non-sovereign loans. They completely dropped my argument in PMC about the idea that if you have creditor committees, this means that they are going to be doing smaller loans more predatorily. That way they move to the creditor committees, and insofar as this is unresponded to, this wins because that means all loans are bad in the future.
pleasantries. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's even. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say that. Um, thank you to Helen for being a fantastic partner. Uh, these are what our second, and I guess, only tournament ever again, which is a little bit sad. But it was a really good time. Our time at Penn last time was really fun. I also had a really good time this tournament. Um, I went in thinking that we would just like bomb, um, but we did well, and that's nice. And this was a fun round. Thanks to the judges. Thanks to Penn. Uh, thanks to the spectators. Good friends inside. Uh, um, and yeah, okay. Let me get my timer and then just wrap this off. Starting in three, two, one. Framing. LOR is correct. The US does not matter, it's completely non unique. So this round is only about small investors. Why does this matter? One, they say the US always gets first bid on their side of the house. So on either side of the house, US is always going to get their money back. So big a uh, big investors like countries are completely non unique. Secondly, ML gives you a lot of reasons why the US, for example, specifically wants these countries to be able to develop very, very well. Again, another reason why they will be investing on either side of the house. The only response that Imo tries to give, which nice itself, is that, oh, the US doesn't like these committees. But given the reasons they all give about why you want them to develop very, very well, and, the, and that then means that these committees are ways in which you can do this in nice ways, because you know you can make them restructure in nice ways such that their economy does not destroy overall. This will be part of the collapse in the future, but that necessarily means that they're probably going to be doing this in very good ways, and the US is not unique. Thus, smaller investors that, one, don't have the intentions that Imo pointed out, but also are not the first bid, are the only delta in this debate. First back collapse and is that on, is on loan being offered less. Even if Western institutions offer anyway, smaller investors stop doing this. This is first because the, while the biggest country, uh, developing countries get donated to by the West, you are, there are uh, smaller investors that are much more likely to go to small, the smaller countries that know that are, they are the riskiest ones. That is, the West is very likely to work with the big countries that they know are not very risky, which means they're not going to be losing their money, which allows them to achieve all the goals that the MO says they want to achieve, which means smaller investors are always focusing on the countries that have the highest amount of risk. Secondly, yeah. I think the entire warranting about the incentive structure of smaller countries or smaller actors within crediting and specifically who they are more likely to invest into is new. So MG, so I think one, MG makes this argument. MG makes the argument that hedge funds and all these are always going to be investing in the riskier countries and smaller countries specifically. I also think this is PMC when we say that uh, the smaller investors are always going to the to these ones. And, and or, sorry, and the flag, uh, the flag is they, these small investors are high, ri high risk, high reward. That's where you can see it in MG. Good? Yeah. Uh, cool. In MG, they tagline it as, what is the reason they get better investors? The first thing on the Yeah. So I think that you get, what is the reason that they get better investors, but it's never tagged as smaller investors. Wait, it's that smaller investors don't enter? It can just be looked at the flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I, it's, it's under there, but like, okay. you guys can look. It's like, I think that's a different bucket of arguments that happens. I'm sure. Just, I assume y'all get what we're saying about. Like, I have smaller investors much, much deeper in my flow, about four minutes in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Secondly, is that the LOR themselves extend the warrants. They know that they always get less money on ops performance from negotiations. That is, when the line is, you know when you do their form of negotiation, you will always be paying less money than the counterfactual. That necessarily means that when you negotiate with the US first, every other smaller investor always gets screwed over. This necessarily means that they, that, that since they know per PMC, there's such high risk whenever they're about investing in these countries, they're probably always much more likely to invest elsewhere. Because even if they are high risk, the risk is so high that they would not want to take that, uh, not want to take that risk. Great. I want to do the comparative with fiscal colonizing. One, even when we can, order. yeah. I think the trade-off analysis argument for the small companies, i.e. that the small companies won't invest because they know that the U.S. will always negotiate first, is one, a new argument about the implication of how the United States will negotiate an hour counterfactual, but is also a new argument about the trade-off for the small investors. I think this is explicitly just PMC and G. Where? Like, he's just, this is where? literally the entire <laughs> PMC and like, I think the saying? judges know where it is. If you want me to flag it, I can. If you like, don't know where it is, how can the judges know? Okay. Well, I have to. Okay. That's okay. So, <laughs> Helen, Helen, do you want to start by flagging this and then I'll flag yeah. it? Yeah. Um, this is the risk reward calculus um, argument, which is that obviously when there's informational asymmetry, you think that the largest actor is going to get their loans back first because they have more bargaining power towards that. Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. Then I don't. I'm not going to um, 
mean, that's kind of where I was. Plus, I'm going to tell you to shut up. Can y'all move away? Or this is the worst recording of all time. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm recording this in post. Read the post. This is just the craziest after recording ever. I, I have a request of leaving an in going, yeah, I know it's new. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. This is the comparative of fiscal columnists. Even if it's true, they drop the MG comparative that for countries that do get trapped into cycles of debt, the counterfactual is the economy that was already going to be extremely bad anyway, because they have no mechanism that they've given for why these people can regulate their economies better. Why then are we able to do this better on our side of the house? One, dropped out of MG that the people moderating these uh, committees are international organizations. And this is really important because, one, when the MO tells you that these are the ones that care about the ways in which these countries develop, obviously they want to moderate these in very good ways so that they don't get screwed over because if they care about them developing, if the US and all these other institutions want their economies to be very, very, very good, they don't want them to be super screwed over, you need them to be operating well. Which means, one, even if they are trapped in cycles of debt, that's better than the counterfactual in which they're using this money and incredibly permission in bad ways and don't have anyone checking back on them. So the counterfactual is always better. Secondly, the counterfactual for this is the counterfactual only for countries that default. That is, any country that does not default faces none of the arguments that the LOR gives you. That trade-off is also really important because one, the comparative that we give you both in PMC and MG is any country that defaults is probably a country that is incredibly corrupt, thus it's using this money in incredibly bad ways anyway. So the comparative then is maybe some uh, some of those countries like get uh, have to go through bad fiscal colonizing thingies and they get into cycles of debt. But given that, given that we told you these people are going to be in bad cycles anyway because their governments are incredibly corrupt, the, what, the actors that we should pri be prioritizing in debate are the good countries that would be using this money well, that now because smaller investors are pulling out, now they never get that money overall. You recognize one, those are the people that are not able, never, never able to get access to health care in the comparative. So if on our side of the house they get far more money, they are able to do things like get roads, get access to jobs, get go to hospitals, go to school, etc. These are the impacts and the things that actually matter in the debate. And I want to know this is in terms Incredibly important insofar as even if they're winning, that a lot of these a lot of the countries would be defaulting on our side of the house. That's fine, given that one, it's not going to be done in incredibly bad ways, so the impact is not that high. But two, the impact to the countries that are able to actually use this money very well and don't default is far higher. Great. The next thing, that, uh, okay. The second thing, oh yeah, two responses to the email that I need to do. One is the uh, one is that they always, oh yeah, it's this thing that you always give bad deals. I want to note that their argument nice itself. That is when they tell you that these organizations are going to be working together to do these uh, to do these negotiations. That's when the U, uh, that's when the MG and MO uh, responses kick in. That is when the U.S. comes to the table on our side of the house with everyone else. They don't want the, the bad, the smaller investors to be doing this in incredibly pernicious ways. This is what I told you at the top. Now instead of making forcing them to do debt cycles. You force them to do restructuring or things like or replacing parts of the government, things like that. Even if this is bad and you lose some money, that is still always better than a counterfactual and means it's not an incredibly bad deal. The other reason why you're not always giving bad deals to begin with is one, you are competing with other small investors, so you always have to be doing this in good ways. But secondly, uh, it's probably the fact that you're probably not going to be, yeah. yeah. I think the warrant specifically about like United States and other large actors acting in this way because of specific fears of small actors is new. So this is a turn to the MO. MO makes a new argument that you care how, about the way in which these countries function. I am turning that to say, if that's true, then you would always be forcing these negotiations to be happening in, in good ways. We also just look at the MG argument under better investors. The second thing that I say is when there is competition, then you are forced to offer better deals because there's more options on the table. Yes, I, I like that. That's fine. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we're good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lastly, the counterfactual is sold for funds. There is no response except that it, it asserted it's not unique in LLC. What are the warrants in MO? That the people who are super scared always sell. But one, we told you these people are infinitely more scared on their side of the house because they know the risk is always higher. So it's not the case that these, uh, the amount of fear these people have is a metric. They're always much more fearful on their side of the house. Then every single reason that vul why vulture funds are bad, always far worse than the comparative out of MG and PMC is completely dropped. That then means even if everyone giving the money is completely symmetric, when they default, the, uh, the result of that default is always far worse than just allowing them to, re to restructure overall, especially all the mitigation we've done for why they wouldn't be, uh, why, for our, for why you do this badly, proud. Thank you.